Hi, I'm Amy Beers, and on this episode of Drinking With Beers, I'll be walking you through a guided tasting of some beer that I curated from St. Joseph Brewery here in Indianapolis to share with you. And then stick around because later in this episode, we'll get the chance to talk with Alan and JJ, who are the brewers behind the beer. This is actually part two of my feature on St. Joseph Brewery. And the reason I broke it up into two parts is because I wanted to feature the beer, but also because St. Joseph Brewery has some really great history. If you're not familiar with this brewery, it used to be a church. And I love that because it kind of pays homage to beer's early role in religion. So if you wanna learn more about the history of St. Joseph Brewery, as well as kind of get a brief little history of beer's role in religion, look for that video. It is part one of the St. Joseph Brewery feature. I will post a link in this video description below if you wanna watch that. Also, if you like learning about beer and history, make sure you are subscribed to my channel so you don't miss a video. Okay, so in this episode of Drinking With Beers, we'll be tasting the Benevolent Blonde, the Confessional IPA, and the Hefeweizen. So if you grab this beer to drink along with me, great. Go ahead, grab yourself a glass, and we'll get started. So today's tasting is really fun. We have a German, a Belgian, and an American style beer. Now there are four main ingredients in every beer. You have malts, hops, water, and yeast. And between those four main ingredients will impart different flavors and characteristics to the beer. For today's tasting, we have two beers that are more malt forward with some yeast characteristics that really shine through. And then we have a beer that's totally different. We have an American IPA, which balances more toward hop characteristics. We'll start with the two maltier beers, starting with the German Hefeweizen. One of the things I love about St. Joseph's is that it used to be in a church and the fact that they name a lot of their beers with religious themes. So this German Hefeweizen is a Kirscheweizen. Kirsche is the word for church. So Hefeweizen. Hefe is German for yeast and then Weizen is the word for wheat. So this is a yeast wheat beer. Anytime you see the word Weizen in a beer, you know it's gonna be a wheat beer, or uh, Weiss, Weiss is also a term for wheat. You will notice that this beer imparts some haziness. That comes from the yeast that are suspended within the beer. This is an unfiltered yeast, yeasty wheat beer. So a German Hefeweizen, or a German wheat beer, uses a minimum of 50% wheat malt and up to 70% wheat malt. And the reason that brewers don't use 100% wheat malt for their wheat beers is that wheat, when it's mixed with hot water, tends to get really thick and sticky and messy. And it's just really impossible to work with. I mean, imagine if you tried to make beer out of oatmeal. It's not happening. So at least half of the beer is made with wheat malt and the rest of it is made with malted barley. It's typically a Pilsner malt. And what the German Hefeweizen is really known for hmm, are these really nice notes of banana and clove. And that comes from the yeast. Typically a wheat beer will taste kind of bready. And also it'll have sort of this fluffy texture or what's called a mouth feel. The next beer is a blonde ale or another term for it you might see is golden ale. This is a very mild, easy drinking beer. If you're new to craft beer, or if you have a friend you're trying to introduce to the craft beer scene, this style is a really great style to start with because it's very approachable. It's almost like a lager, except it's an ale, so it has a little bit more complexity than a lager. And in fact, Belgium created this style to compete with the Pilsner, which is a very popular lager. Across the board, Belgian ales tend to be more malt forward, so you get a little bit of sweetness, and the hop flavors and bitterness is pretty low, if any at all. Belgian ales are also very highly regarded for their yeast characteristics, which imparts a lot of fruit and spice type flavors. They're also typically highly attenuated, they finish dry, and they're highly carbonated, making them a very just nice, refreshing, zesty sort of beer. Go ahead and give us a whiff with me. So like the Hefeweizen, a lot of these flavors come from the yeast, except you're not really gonna get any of that banana flavor, it's more orange-like flavors. 
It's very soft and perfumey. Do you see what I mean? How it's kind of like a lager, except it has a little bit more complex flavors. And that, again, that comes from the yeast. Just really easy drinking. Next we have the American IPA, or India Pale Ale, if you're not familiar. IPA stands for India Pale Ale. Pale Ale has actually been around for a really long time. Uh, and despite the fact that it's called an India Pale Ale, it actually hails from Britain when the British were exporting their pale ales to India. And the IPA has gone through quite a long evolutionary journey. And when it was adopted by the American craft brewers during the start of the craft beer revolution, it developed more of a citrus profile from the American hops. And unlike the previous two beers, whose balance is more toward malts, the IPA is definitely leaning more towards the hop characteristics and that hop bitterness. It's basically an amped up pale ale. So IPAs are all over the world. And they all vary by region because the hops that grow in those regions are very different. But what American hops are really known for are those citrus characteristics. Now American hops do have quite a range, but mainly what they're known for are citrus, as well as tropical fruit and pine. It's been a while since I've had the confessional IPA. I'm definitely getting some notes of citrus from those American hops. And then I suddenly got this burst of pine. It's really nice. Tell me what you guys think though. So IPAs also tend to be a little higher in alcohol. So I always tell people, if you're drinking the confessional IPA, be careful, don't drink too much because you may end up confessing some things that you don't want people to know. But hey, if you're drinking it at St. Joseph's Brewery, I guess at least you're in the right place. So tell me what you guys think about these beers. Did you like them? What kind of notes or flavors or aromas did you get out of them? If you notice the difference between the malty beers versus the hoppy beers, I really would love to hear your feedback. And of course, by all means, feel free to keep drinking these beers as we chat with the men behind the brews. JJ and Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So tell us about these beers. Let's start with the Hefeweizen. So the Hefeweizen, uh, actually, one important note is that we recently started canning beer, uh, which yeah. we had never done in the past. I saw, I was chatting with you when we were at the, when I was at the brewery and you mentioned that it was a way to survive the COVID restrictions. Uh, yeah, well, when they shut down all the bars and restaurants, we basically had no place to sell beer. So uh, we had only done keg beer before that. So we managed to, uh, get some beer in cans. We did our house beers first, confessional IPA, uh, benevolent blonde, uh, Belgian blonde, and then uh, cornerstone Coles. Those were the three that we did first. And then our first seasonal uh, to be canned was the uh, Hefeweizen. Were a lot of people coming in for growlers when the COVID stuff started happening? Like before you started canning? We were selling growlers as much as we could, uh, but the cans definitely helped increase uh, increased sales for carry out. It's just a lot more people, I think, uh, prefer to have, uh, you know, a four pack of cans instead of a growler. I wasn't here during most of the COVID shutdown, but um, you have to do a, a special cleaning for each grab. It, a can is just come and grab it and pay and go. Makes it a little more easy. Yeah. When did you start canning? What was the day? Do you remember? <laughs> was it pretty much right away or did it was it kind of more of a process actually you know what it's on the uh it's on the bottom of that blonde can you have there that's the first okay. date this is the first batch so in april yeah. towards the end of april i feel like this is kind of a historic can maybe you should hang on to this like this is the first the date mark of when first, uh, you guys started canning Let's talk, let's go down the line. I already did a tasting, so I kind of went through just what the stylistically, what to expect from these beers. Um, but yeah. do you want to go through maybe specific ingredients that you used? No. No, you don't want to give away your secrets? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what percentage of wheat malt did you use in the Hefeweizen? Uh, the, the Hefeweizen is over 50% wheat. It's uh, 
if I remember right, it's it's about 56 or 58 percent wheat, I believe. Uh, I can't quite remember exactly, but it's definitely over 50 percent. Um, but that's a pretty simple recipe, uh, just wheat pilsner malt for the most part. Um, maybe uh, maybe a couple other things, but not much. Just very simple. Did you use rice holes to uh, help filter up the so the mash didn't get too sticky? Was that the, was we this did? Yeah, uh, yeah. You were actually here uh, the day we brewed the second batch. Um, yeah. yeah, and you. Uh, yeah, we use rice hulls in uh, in our wheat beers to prevent that mash from getting too sticky and getting stuck on us, so that we uh, don't have a horrible brew day. Yeah, because that gets pretty messy and just impossible to work with, right? If you're not careful, it can. Yeah, yeah, it can for yeah. sure, especially if, if you have a lot of wheat. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. How long did it take you to clean up the mess? Um, well, it depends. It depends on whether you try and save the beer. <laughs> Sometimes you can save it and get a little bit of work, or and it may take many, many hours to do that. Or if you give up on it, the cleanup is really not that long. Just an hour or two. <laughs> so it depends on how soon you give up. What was that, JJ? <laughs> I think it's only happened to you once right here, Alan. I've had a couple. I've had two. Uh, one was a... a a beer with a lot of oats in it that got stuck. Um, and then I had one that I had to dump that was absolutely devastated. Couldn't get it to run at all. Uh, it was actually a problem that we had with our mill when we first opened. Um, our mill was uh, really, uh, it was way out of adjustment and we noticed it pretty quickly that we were not gonna be able to uh, save that beer. So that's always so sad. It was rough, but there's another one that got stuck with a lot of oats, but I managed to get enough work to, to get some beer out of it. I imagine to clean up the oat mess, you just like bring in a bunch of horses, be like, all right, shut down. We could try that. I, I haven't... Try it next time. I, I don't want to be there for that. Please let me know. <laughs> I'll come riding in on my faithful steed, like, all right, guys, I'm going to help you clean up this mess. <laughs> yeah, we can try it. Okay. I like it, I like it. Uh, so when you say you put rice hulls in with the mash when you're making the wheat beer, that's different than an adjunct. Maybe you could explain. It's not designed, as, it's not a, a, a source of uh, sugar or flavor, color. It, they're just designed to actually help keep the, um, the, the wheat mold, especially from getting clumped together. Yeah. Um, so it acts as a filter aid or an aid to filtration, basically. So tell me about this blonde ale. This benevolent blonde. Your turn, JJ. That's one of your favorites. Mm. Hmm. is one of my favorites. <laughs> okay. Oh. <No. laughs> um. I mean, what what would you like to know about it? Um. What type of yeast? What type of yeast strain did you use? Uh, we use uh, a chuf, a yeast strain. Um. So it's a uh, lachuf. Le Chouf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A Belgian Sounds strain. Sounds so fancy. Le Chouf. Right. So, it, yeah, you can uh, you can find their beer on the shelves and stuff, but uh, we use uh, their same uh, yeast strain. Uh, it has a lot of, like, fruity, spicy notes to it. What type of malts did you use? Oh, I oh. always... You don't have to give me exact oh. ratios. That one, again, <laughs> is uh, mostly, it's pretty simple. We use, uh, uh, that's all European malts. Okay. We used some uh, Pilsner uh, and a couple Belgian uh, malts for a little color and uh, aroma mm -hmm. flavor. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that blonde ale really, uh, it's the yeast that really kind of takes over and really pushes a lot of those flavors in there. Um, so fairly simple malt build, but um, a ton of flavor from that yeast. Yeah. So keeping the malt, keeping the malt build simple to kind of set the stage for the yeast, which really, you know, what this style is all about. Tell me about this confessional IPA. Confessional IPA is, uh, well, that's our, I guess, kind of our flagship beer. That's our number one seller. Um, it was designed as a uh, seasonal beer when we opened. 
hmm. and uh, I have not stopped making it since. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, and we we make quite a bit of it. It, it sells uh, sells really well for us. It, it's um, it's an American style IPA, uh, very simple malt um, profile, uh, two row and uh, uh, two row little honey malt and. Um, very simple. It features uh, Citra, Hollertal Blanc, and Mandarina hops. So uh, three different, uh, an American hop and two uh, two German hops in there also. Okay. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's um, it's from Germany. It's a, I think its full name is Mandarina Bavaria. Okay. Um, but it, it, it's definitely, uh, it's one of the, it's one of the hops that Germany has been focusing on to, to kind of uh, to create those uh, those fruitier, more um, I guess those IPA hops, the the aroma hops, the the uh, the stuff to compete with what we make here in the U.S. that are extremely popular for uh, pales and IPAs. That's what I was wondering if Germany was trying to copy or compete with American IPAs because they've become so popular. I, I believe so. I, I believe that is the story that uh, um, certain American hops are, they, they've crossbred them over there to so they can grow them in their climate, but uh, just to kind of recreate those citrus flavors, American hops just come with. Blanc is definitely a much more modern style hop designed for aroma and flavor in uh, pales and IPAs. It's got a, a lot more of a fruity character to it than what you find in uh, and something like middle fruit, mm -hmm. um, or saws, or other varieties like that. That beer mainly features citra. Citra is the dominant hop um, by weight in uh, in that beer for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely getting a lot of that citrus. I I kind of feel like it picked up on a little bit of pine. I, I can see that. I, this, that might come piney might come from the citra or the blanc as well. Uh, probably not mandarina as much. Uh, I feel like Blanc kind of has that character to it sometimes. I know it's a super popular IPA. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's what top uh, combination for really what drives those flavors. And uh, just, that's the part. So I love that I know you have different variations of the confessional. Like I was scrolling through your beer list on your website and hazy IPAs is one of my favorite beer styles. And I love your uh, that the fact that you call your hazy IPA the hazy confessional. But I love that you stick with the whole religious theme and you name your beers after sort of these religious conventions. Do you ever find that you run out of names? Like, how do you? What's your process for naming your beer? It's a terrible. It's a terrible process. It takes years and uh, <laughs> lots of heartache. <laughs> <laughs> no, it. Naming is, is difficult. Um, a lot of names are taken. Uh, craft beer is, is uh, obviously there's there's an unbelievable amount of different brands out there, and so it's very hard sometimes to find a, number one find a name that isn't taken, um, and then find something that uh, will work for what we're doing. Yeah. So it, sometimes we we hit one and it's easy. Sometimes it, it takes a while so what got you, what got you guys into brewing beer <laughs> it really is it's just that simple for me it's that i love beer and i uh, wanted to learn more about it yeah took it further i guess what about you jj uh i started home brewing after i received a free kegerator and um and it really just started off as just something that sounded like a fun hobby to get into. I got this free kegerator from a friend and got into, just got into a little hobby. I figured it was cheaper to make beer than it was to keep buying it. Yeah. And uh, so I, I started doing that and then quickly it just ended up becoming something I was really excited about, started buying books. Um, I think when you make your first batch, it's, it's not very good. And uh, it's drinkable. Like the first batch I made was drinkable, but uh, it was not not great. And I think uh, you keep just diving in, trying to perfect it, learning more, and then 
uh, I was doing extract batches, and then you go into whole, uh, you know, you go into all grain brewing, and then you're getting new equipment, and then you start learning about water chemistry, and, and it's just one thing after another, and the next thing you know, you spend a ton of money. <laughs> 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 They're like, maybe I should do this as a profession to justify all of the money that's going out to, to brew my own beer. Um, I, I mean, I still have all my home brewing stuff, so I, uh, I haven't, I haven't home brewed in a while, but, uh, I was going to say, it seems like when you work at a place, like for example, let's say you work at a pizza place yeah. and I've heard that it kind of ruins you for pizza. But it doesn't sound like this is the case with brewing. I would not say it ruined no. it. Um, and in <laughs> fact, we've been able to um, uh, use my system to kind of find out um, certain, we, we've used it small ways, pilot system to like learn about uh, a different hop we, we would get in. Um, and then I've been able to find some recipes um, and scale them up from from that uh, from my setup um, I suppose that's super cost effective if you're you know doing some sort of experimental beer you can do it in a smaller batch and not waste so much money and then if it works you can yeah scale it up what was the first beer that you brewed for your homebrew batch for a homebrew batch um, it was it was a Kolsch um, that had these pineapple notes that shouldn't have been there. <laughs> no, that's not part of the Kolsch. That's not part of the Kolsch parameters. I would say my first batch of homebrew that I ever made that was good was a, a gumball head package recipe from Great Fermentations. What was it? Uh, I'm cutting out. What was it? It, um, it was a, a gumball head recipe. Oh. Uh, from Great Fermentations. I can't remember what they called it. It was whatever, it, you know, kind of, it sounds like gumball head, mm -hmm. but it's not. Um, and so they they just make those box recipes. You can go in there and go buy it and like make a homebrew. And yeah. uh, so that was, that was the first good batch that I made. It, that we were we were comparing side by side with, uh, with uh, gumball head and to make sure that, you know, I, I mean, it, surprisingly it tasted really similar. So you mentioned that the Hefeweizen that you brew at St. Joseph is one of your favorites. Is that because your first successful homebrew was a similar style? Oh, it, well, it was it? Well, yeah, that was like a hoppy wheat. <laughs> but right. uh, like gumball heads, like a hoppy wheat. But um, I think Hefeweizen's my one of my favorites because it was just like one of the styles I really looked into to learn about like, um, like find out more about what meant, how, how to get those banana clove flavors. Alan, what's your favorite beer to brew? Well, I mean, Confessional is the one we brew the most by far. So that one's, uh, that's usually a pretty easy brew day. I know uh, that one's, uh, yeah. nope. uh, I know how to do that one pretty, uh, pretty effectively. So um, I like to brew, um, I mean, I like brewing new seasonal beers that we haven't done before. That's usually uh, fun. Um, Do you like to get really creative? Uh, we try sometimes. I mean, it, it depends. Sometimes you want to keep it simple. Sometimes you want to be creative and wild with it. And it uh, depends on the, what we're trying to achieve, I guess. Do you guys both get to basically decide the beer list? Or is that more of like a team effort? Like who decides what you guys are going to brew? Is it? purely up to just you guys or uh mostly yeah yeah well that's cool yeah i decide what uh styles we're gonna do we come up with the recipes um yeah that's usually we, how it works we do have uh somewhat of a calendar that uh we stick by to tell it like to what we brew seasonally we brew uh, uh black lager every year uh usually yeah, it's a good one. I've had it. You guys just did a switcheroo on me. <laughs> huh? Did you see that? I don't know what you're seeing on your end. You guys switched places. My phone is now at 20%. It was letting me know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs>
Well, I think we're pretty much about done. Do you have any confessions? I'm we're having. Do you, yeah. Do you have any confessions you want to tell? Oh. <laughs> yeah, but everything we tell you about that IPA is top secret and off the record, by the way. So yeah, yeah. don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> don't tell anybody about those hops or anything. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for joining us and, t and telling us about your creations. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Cheers. Alan, do you have a beer? I do. Oh, cheers. Prost. <laughs> <laughs>